a good crowd here tonight. Yeah, well, welcome all. Thank you for deciding to brave the clouds and the raindrops and come on up the hill to look for monarchs today. I'm Patty and I work here at Bonnyvale Environmental Education Center and, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Kelly Price, our local game warden. I usually interact with him in a different context. <laughs> we have uh, various baby animals that need Critters animals. that need attention. Yes, but <clears throat> Kelly, on the sly, if you ask me, has been studying insects for a very, very, very long time and makes trips to Central America where he is he knows an awful lot about jeweled scarabs. Indeed. Indeed, and has one named after him and one My named daughter, after yeah. his daughter. And he's <clears throat> going down to do some research. Will you tell us a little bit about the research you're sure. going to do? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just hand it over to you. Then. All right, Kevin right. Price. Good afternoon. I enjoy doing these talks. They're beneficial. I think they're educational. Um, obviously, you're all here because you have some interest in whether it be just natural history or monarchs or insects in general. Um, I have been dabbling in the world of insects probably since I was 11 um, in one way, shape or form. But in the past 20 years or so, I've kind of gone a little overboard <laughs> and started to, my, my first trip to the tropics actually was a little more recent. 1999, I made my first trip to Costa Rica. And for me, it was, I mean, I can say it was life changing in a way to go down there and to see the way the tropics really are. Um, and I don't mean going to a tourist area. I mean actually seeing a country, going out into the wilderness um, with local people or friends that I have made where we're backpacking or doing tent hammocks out in the middle of the continental divide somewhere, mm -hmm. bringing all of our gear in. That's seeing a country. Um, and I have been to Ecuador several times in Mexico and Panama and Costa Rica. And I'd like to go to a lot of other places, but predominantly Central America. For my interests, basically Mexico to Ecuador is the corridor or the landmass that I have interest in geographically for the jewel scarabs that I research with a, a friend of mine who's retired from UC Riverside, <clears throat> an entomologist there who, strictly speaking, uh, studies the um, Chrysina is the genus. So we've been doing that for a while, the jeweled scarabs. If anyone's seen them, they look like they're painted, well, not painted, look like they're solid gold or silver. Mm -hmm. Some of them are green, but they're pretty amazing creatures and they, they need a very specific habitat and they have a very specific uh, relationship with old growth forests. So not only have I been working with him to identify new species, which is a lot of fun, traveling to these crazy remote areas and sampling the insects that are there, but also trying to gather data points to see the distribution and the natural history of this particular group of insects. Um, so it's a lot of fun and I'm lucky enough to have people I work with that uh, were willing to name a bug after my daughter and then another one after myself. So it's kind of neat, something that's embedded, if you will, in history. Um, so it's pretty special. But today, enough about me, but, uh, and you can ask any questions you wish at any point, please do. Um, but today we're going to concentrate on the monarchs, which um, butterflies and moths are the Lepidoptera. And I'm not as big into them as I am into the beetles, the Coleoptera, which is the largest group. But I find all insects fascinating. Um, you make one trip to the tropics and you see the diversity and the color and the shapes and all of the intricate um, makeup of these creatures. It's, it's, to me, it's mind-blowing. And I have an extensive collection um, that I use to go talk to the kids and bring to school and just for my own personal enjoyment because I find them fascinating. Um, I think that there's not enough information out there about insects and how incredibly important they are to all the ecosystems in the world and they're such an indicator species. And if for those who don't know, um, put this, to, to try and wrap your head around this, all the biomass in the world, just try and even think about that, all the living biomass in the world, three quarters of all the living biomass in the world is insects. Three quarters. I mean, that's pretty incredible to think about. So I, I put that in perspective too, is how important they are to, to everything. Um, and I think they're oftentimes overlooked. <clears throat> but moving on for today's adventure, um, I want to talk a little bit about the monarchs in general. As you know, monarchs, you may or may not know, monarchs are one of the very few migratory 
um, insects, which is pretty amazing in and of itself, how these creatures with these little microscopic brains are able to uh, migrate from the south to the north and then back down. Um, they have all kinds of hurdles, predation. Um, they have issues with the farmland, which is what we're losing. And when the farms cut their fields, that's another issue. And I know I was speaking to Ed and Mary Ellen about trying to encourage people who have large properties with fields, um, if they're going to try and produce habitat for the monarchs, to cut their fields in a very specific way. The young, short growth milkweed is the best for the larva, not the big, tall adult ones. But obviously you want the big, tall adult ones somewhere to produce the seed for the reproduction of your milkweed, the food source. But you want to mow off your fields, and every year it's different depending on rain and growth rates, but you want to mow off the fields, let's just say, I'm just guessing here, late June-ish, or maybe a little bit earlier, so that secondary growth of the milkweed starts to come up, so that by the time late July, early August hits is when they're normally coming back through, that nice, short, fresh, succulent, milkweed is is starting to grow and you'll you'll if you can find fields where the farmers have just happened to cut on that timing and those young plants that's where you'll find the most caterpillars and i used to love and i still do occasionally go out with my daughter <clears throat> collect a whole bunch of them get them to make the chrysalis and then we'd bring them to her school this is when she was in grammar school and she's not anymore but we used to do that together a lot and that's a lot of fun so i encourage that whether you be an adult or a child if you've seen a chrysalis you know how incredibly um, beautiful they are. That lime green with the gold dots. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, we have um, one right there. <clears throat> lovely. We've got a sample. <clears throat> There's uh, some of the different butterflies that I've seen around the world during their pupil stage. Some of them, the chrysalis is, is all gold. Like it's just been wow. dipped in gold. It's, it's pretty incredible the diversity in color and shapes and um, sizes that there are. So. On that note, yeah, I before we head out to actually start looking for things, I wanted to tell you all a little bit about. Oh, that's what I need now. Um, a a monarch monitoring program that's going to be starting up um, in a week, the end of the last week of July and in, through the first week of August. It's an international monarch monitoring blitz and they're hoping to get lots of people out to visit a section of milkweed. It doesn't matter how big the section is, but to inspect every plant in that section, whether it's five or 135. And they've got a, a simple data sheet here. Um, if, you have, if you're the least bit computer savvy, you should be able to figure it out. And if you aren't, feel free to call me. I'll walk you through it. Uh, there are a couple tricky little things um, for figuring out the year latitude and longitude and the area that you have surveyed, but it's all here. And the one kind of tricky thing that they hope that you will be able to note is how many of each instar of monarch caterpillar you find. And uh, so they go through five different phases from the time they hatch out of their egg to the time that they pupate and make the chrysalis. And this handout that I've sent around describes the different, how you recognize the different instars. So I hope we might see some examples of these once we're out there. Everybody knows that the monarchs are, are because of the milkweed is toxic, oh. that the monarch and the larva are toxic as well. So they don't get preyed on as much. Normally in nature, brightly colored things usually means danger or poison, like the dart frogs and that type of thing. So um, that's just some knowledge there. And as far as if you're gonna participate in the survey or if you enjoy just looking for these, um, monarch larva in the future, I find that if you get down really low when you're looking through the milkweed, because they have a tendency to be on the bottom of the leaf, not the top of the leaf, or looking for the droppings which have a tendency to roll down the leaf into the where the leaf meets the stem so you look for the droppings you can tell that okay there's monarchs here somewhere the larvae are here and i start looking under plants 
Um, and it's also neat that you can see sometimes the eggs. And the female lays her egg in the very tip, the very end and the very tip of the leaf of the milkweed. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of flip them over sometimes and you'll see that little white egg on the very tip of a leaf. So, so how many eggs does she, will she lay at one in one deposit? One egg at a time. Just one at a time. I couldn't tell you how many in total okay. that they normally carry, but I will tell you that they go to individual leaf right. and usually individual plants because they know that that mm -hmm. caterpillar consumes a lot of food and they will mm -hmm. consume that plant in a short period of time and have to crawl and look for another one. So a lot of times it's one egg per stalk per plant um, right in the tip of the leaf and then they just go from plant to plant to plant. I had another question for you before we head out, and I can't remember what it is. Um, what we're going to do is start heading up the hill, and there are a few different patches of milkweed. Do we want to have a strategy for each person take a plant and, and look? And we would well, do want you to do some groups, like a couple groups, so that we're not all in a giant mass. A yeah, yeah. couple so small groups and just... Uh, milkweed. Kind of meander through and as, as a group and if people see something or identify something you can share it um i think that's usually the the best way are, are we counting are we counting what we're finding or are oh, we that was my question um <coughs> I, we won't be recording this for the survey today um however i see you have a notebook sure. and a piece of an piece of paper and, <laughs> and a pencil. If you want to be the official counter, we might as well. The monarch scribe. Yeah, you can so be the monarch scribe. Mary Ellen. Yeah. We see something. Okay. And we'll try together to figure out what the, the instars are. Um, my question was if... What is an instar? It's, well, she didn't get the hand up. Yeah. It's Kelly, a, the caterpillars like the shed cycle, their skin briefly. a number of times from the time they hatch to the time they oh, make the chrysalis. So oh, each oh, one of those yeah. sheddings is a different instar. Yeah, that okay. we saw one like that. Um, so this, this like that. ties into what Ed had just asked, is, is kind of go through the life cycle. So with pretty much all, all insects, predominantly, um, I'm just trying to think if there's an exception, because there's always some exception in nature. Um, you always start with an egg. So you've got a, a breeding pair of insects. In this case, it would be the, the monarchs, which the males, which is interesting. We can talk about this too. Male monarchs, if you look at the hind wings, I wish I had an example or picture. Um, on their hind wings, they've got two very small, I call them spots, if you will, but they're raised and they're on a vein and they're in, almost about in the center of each hind wing. And that identifies the male. The females don't have that. So that's how you can identify a male, female when they're an adult. Um, so you start with an egg. Uh, the female goes around and deposits an egg. That egg develops over a short period of time and hatches out a small caterpillar, very small, larva. And that usually eats its egg shell immediately for some extra nourishment before it starts eating the plant. And then you go through the various five instars. So starting from a very, very small little, little caterpillar which has the stripes, but super, super tiny, and it sheds its skin. And each time it sheds its skin, it gets a little bigger, gets bigger, sheds its skin again, gets bigger, and it goes through that till the fifth instar, and then that's when we get where the caterpillar spins a little silk, attaches its little hind end suckers on there, and hangs upside down in that little J shape. Mm -hmm. And then it'll stay like that for sometimes up to almost a week-ish, and then it splits its skin and it looks like this gelatinous green blob with no real shape. And as that dries, it tightens up and it's like a, a little bit of a chitin exterior shell forms. And that's when we get that pretty chrysalis with the gold dots. And over time, which is neat with these, they become transparent as they develop. So you can actually see inside like a window. So you start to see the wings form and the color come in and they darken up and eventually they emerge and it's, it's really fun if you're there timing wise to see the emergence and then when they emerge their wings are all dried up and shriveled they look like they're not well they're not functional and then they hang um they hang for a while and they actually pump fluid into their wings and once that fluid is pumped into their wings and they fully expanded they dry and the interesting part is with most moths and butterflies if they were to fall or injure themselves during that drying process and get a, a deformation in that wing 
and then it dries when that chitin dries that's it there's there's no fixing it there's nothing you can do to soften it nature doesn't have a way to repair that so usually they can't fly and that one usually doesn't end up making it very long so it's important that they have a place to hang and fully dry and expand their wings and then they can be released and that's the fun part too is if you do it yourself you can watch this whole process and then you can watch them hatch and then you can literally you know, put them on your finger and you know release them so it's, it's a really neat thing to do then of course comes the 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 whole next evolution in their Oh, yeah. grand uh, 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 expansion, if you will, or, or all their traveling for their migration. So they go through these life cycles. They're basically hopscotching north through life cycles. So they hopscotch north, have a life cycle, you know, in a certain area. Then they hopscotch further north. Then they get all the way up to wherever they stop. And then they do the reverse. It comes back down, comes back so down, lots comes of back down. There's lots of generations that move through. And therein lies kind of the dilemma that they have in needing that habitat as they do all of these. They're coming north and they're going south. They not only need their flowers and, and food sources when they're adults for the nectar, um, but the larvae need that nourishment of the milkweed. So if there's no milkweed, we aren't going to have the caterpillars. We aren't going to produce the adults. They're going to have a harder time. So it really has to do with open lands where there's milkweed and the cutting and the, and the farming. Um, it, it really, I wish it would coincide with the migration and it doesn't always do that. So, okay. yes. So just quickly, I had an experience last summer where I had um, a, a swamp milkweed plant in, actually in my garden in a raised bed and I have some pictures of it and I had probably 12 to 15 caterpillars on that one plant. Wow. They, to they totally devoured all the leaves. And then they formed chrysalises all around my house. These were monarchs, right? Ooh. These were monarchs. Uh, on the porch, on chairs. Mm -hmm. And I think I got to see 11 or 12 actually go through the whole metamorphosis. Oh. That's unusual. That's yeah. just interesting. And I, and I don't unusual. know whether it's this particular you know, variety of, mm -hmm. of swamp milkweed. So what I've done is I've, I've bought um, um, Helen O'Donnell at Bunker Farm grew these plants and I bought some more for, from her and, and a friend of, is also doing this. So I've got about 10 plants now that I'm trying just to see if this was an anomaly last year mm -hmm. or not. And the perennials I assume, right? They're perennials. Yeah. So last year's is up again. Yeah. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, I'm curious as to, so this is not a field plant or, it, or it's a swamp plant. I don't, I think John, it, it grows wild also, doesn't it? Yeah. Swamp? yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, it worked in the garden. So I, I'm thinking that you know, if if something like this is successful, then we in 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 the community can start thinking about how we can help the population by growing these in our gardens. I have seen, uh, particularly with the butterflies, that that there is an adaptation. And many butterflies aren't aren't always host specific. Right. There's a little bit of they'll go from different plant to different plant, but there are several who are very host specific. If there isn't that exact plant, yeah. you're not going to find them. And another one's like the pipe vine swallowtail which um, we've been getting a little bit, it's been croaching north. Um, I remember the last time I saw them or collected them was at my house, which happened to have pipe vine in Northampton. I've never seen them all the way up here, but I'm sure there are if you can find pipe vine, but pipe vine isn't that common anymore. It used to be a, a very you know common ornamental plant on people's property, but not so much anymore. But your comment about producing habitat in, on, on your land Butterflies and moths in general, the populations have just, I don't, I, I don't know why, there's probably multiple reasons, but all of us here when we were, you know, their age or younger, I just remember seeing so many more butterflies around in, in your yard or in your grandmother's house or family member's house. Uh, I just don't see the numbers anymore in the quantity, and I think there's multiple reasons for that. But we can always encourage that by planting a host plants are important, but also producing the, uh, the habitat, the, the food, the flowers. And, and that will bloom at different times throughout the year. You'll encourage them to your property. And the milkweed is fine. I mean, if you, I mean, I want everybody, encourage everybody to, to take a close look and get as close as you can. You could always break off a leaf. It's not going to hurt the milkweed. It's not going to cause a problem. Break off the leaf with the caterpillar on it. Then you won't have to touch it. And then you can always put it back down on top of the, you know, milkweed if you don't want to touch it so that's an option. A question about the fields and you know mowing mm -hmm. so 
we've got a field that hasn't yet been mowed. If we mowed it now, is that going to be harmful? If you have if you have currently milkweed growing in that field successfully, I would just say wait this year. Let that do its yeah, thing. We've got it just on the side. We could leave the milkweed. Yep. But I've had people also so mow more. around and leave the milkweed kind of in the center, but mow everything else. Okay. Because it also allows when those milkweed pods burst, um, that short grass that you've mowed allows those seeds to kind of dissipate in that in that other area where they can get down and, oh. and hopefully establish themselves again. And that's another way. If you don't have milkweed. Stop by some yeah. fields, grab some pods when they're about to, you know, <clears throat> when they're fully developed and they're about to burst. Grab those pods and dry them out and you can bring them and you can just mm. sprinkle them around and, and, you know, introduce the milkweed somewhere else. Because milkweed can die off too. If you mow it at the wrong time or mow it too much, it ends up just killing the roots and it just dies. So you can always reintroduce it with some seed pods. And so. Kelly, so any of the three types are okay for here? I know there are three types. Right? Of the milkweed you yeah. mean? Well, we, we have a field that would like to boost it up. It's just grass at the moment. We just bought the property. And it sounds like it. Well, I, I believe so. I mean, case in point, you, you can't go wrong. But it's they're not, not invasive, the other ones. That, I, I don't know plants enough to know. I don't want to see... Very invasive milkweed growing all around here called black swallowwort. It's a vine, extremely invasive. But not a milkweed. It is a milkweed. Oh, it is a milkweed. Can you yeah. point it out? Oh, it's a vine. It's a down there. So I guess the way around that would be, at this point, we know that there's okay. two types of milkweed, which is our native one that we're in the fields, with the big pods, okay. and then this swamp milkweed, which is relatively new to me, but I, I believe I know what you're talking it about. Looks like, it looks pretty. like Joe Pye weed. It doesn't yeah. look like yeah. oh, really? but it's not, it's not as tall as Joe Pye, but the leaves look like Joe Pye yeah. leaves. Uh, and when I'm you snap them, they still produce that milky yeah. substance yeah. yeah and the flowers okay. the flowers look a little different too huh. yeah i believe i know what you're speaking of but it's really fragrant right <clears throat> it's really yeah. fragrant I lovely have, lovely yeah. lovely i have lovely. the exact yeah. one yeah. I think you're talking about yeah. along my fence yeah. and and it's just i have a photograph of anyone which is orange Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is that a native plant around here? Oh, okay. So I just consulted Newcombs earlier because that is another one of the questions they ask on the survey for the, the Blitz is what species of milkweed are you looking at? And I was thinking, oh, it's all just common milkweed around here. But there are a few other kinds. And we're going to see a lot of variety that you'll see in the common milkweed when we're out there looking right now. Most of what you'll encounter is common, but if it looks really different, it could be swamp or the butterfly milkweed. So just be aware of that too. And I just want to say one other thing, since Kelly's encouraging people to mow to create monarch habitat, here we also encourage people not to mow because, to, of, birds. because of the birds. Yeah. So what I'd encourage you to do is if you've got a good patch of milkweed in your field, you can go out and mow it with a scythe by hand or something early in the season and be a little selective about it and not just mow your whole field. If you Indeed. happen to have a whole field of milkweed, yeah. what we used to do here, now we just mow late, is uh, we'd go and watch for where the bobolinks were landing to build their nests and stake it and then mm -hmm. just mow around those places. Yep. So there are some That's workarounds there. Yeah. There's always always yeah. a dilemma somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right. Shall we go find some milkweed? Because we don't We're have heading up on the hill, everybody. And we, uh, so we everybody, this way, right. follow. You opened up the door. Right around the end, Ed. Okay, with the, with the, with the <laughs> follow Ed. I'm following Ed. Follow Ed. I'm following you. <laughs> What's this way? <laughs> That's a milkweed. This is a milkweed. It really looks like a vine. Oh no! But it does have these little pods oh, that I'm are going to turn. You know, out. release fluffy little things. The problem is. These are non-nutritious for the monarchs. Uh, they don't provide any nutrition, and the larva laid here won't won't survive. Oh, so this is really nasty. Fake. Do you know what this is? This is the milkweed. Well, we, what we have here is the um, black swallow wart wrapped around bittersweet. Yeah, I was going to say the bittersweet too. Oh yeah, I mean, my gosh! Oh boy! Wow. Have you seen the course needles like wow they have the plots over here they go It looks like I wonder if you've gotten that. Why don't you break Is that milkweed? Yeah. It is, it's just got some type of a virus or disease or something. Yeah. Same with those. 
so probably nobody's laying eggs on it. How tiny are the eggs? Are they really, really They are tiny but visible. And are they oblong really, or round? They are an oval shape oval. that come to almost like a little bit of a point, and they have a texture to them. They're not smooth like other eggs. You, okay. They're text, they are yeah, textured. They're kind of ribbed, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. And did you say they're at the tip underneath? Yes, and the very, I mean, literally, they'll, yeah, those they'll, they'll literally lay them like right there. Um, I have seen, if you would like I've seen cluster see eggs, I've believe it or not, of forms like you're talking about, all tightly packed next to each other. And if they're the ones you're speaking of, we wouldn't know because we don't have to see. But um, believe it or not, a lot of times those are um, eggs of. Um, Stink bugs. The uh, scientific Because the stink bug also goes through nymph phases. Where they start out small and uh, progressively get bigger before they, they look like a stink bug. They don't, they don't even resemble a stink bug in the beginning. So. So. What'd you find? Oh, the milkweed beetle. Yeah, the red milkweed beetles. They do have an association with milkweed, and you'll find another caterpillar, which I can't think of the name of. It's actually, mo it turns into a moth, not a butterfly. But you'll see them eating the, the milkweed, and they're, they're fuzzy, and they're white, brown, and black. And they have all the fuzzies on them, and they're very big. They're like, they're like so big. Different kind of caterpillar, or? It's a neck. Yeah, I'm gonna break it off. My eyes aren't as good as they used to be. I know, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's very pointy. Just looks like a, I, I almost want to say it is. That is what it looks like. Oh. That's a good example okay. of this huh. probably is a monarch egg. Okay. If that's Great. even cool. possible to get on the camera. That's good to know. So now we know what I'm yes, looking for. Yes, I got for. it. Yeah. The little white, the little white dot. How do you see information for that during that? Okay. Is there a website? Let's see if we can find any uh, more uh, advanced stages. From what you said, these are also too big, but it is, are those some other sort of egg? They are too big for monarch. It's either that or it's milk. It's milk. Oh, it's no milk. kidding. Oh. Sometimes if you molest the oh. leaves too much, they actually will secrete the Oh, the interesting. Milk will I've seen I've seen moths and butterflies both. They just basically pick a spot and they just hang there. Underneath a leaf. Underneath a leaf. Sometimes even just on a on a plant, on a, on a weed or a plant. It's just kind of where they decide to rest. You find another egg. I think it's an egg. Nico. Nico. Whoop. Nico. You want to see the egg? I want to see the egg. Is it right there? Could be. Gentle. Could be. Too small? Just Too big? Could be. I'm also looking at some other a, a leakage of, of the. But it's. I don't. Yeah, you don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. touch it. But right. Yeah. There would be only one. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't quite fit the exact shape, but it's yeah. possible. I don't, have my I don't have mine either, so. That little white thing right there. Yeah. Maybe. Sometimes I have a little 10x loop that I like to carry. Oh, mine's in Oh, look. Yeah. Is it yellowish? Oh, I didn't. No, that'd be that's that's too big. That's oh, much okay. too big. Something else. Yeah, something else. Oh, you're asking, somebody asked about the dew, the dew on their wings. Um, I find sometimes that just like the, the vultures do, how they sun themselves, the butterflies do the same thing. They'll get the, the warmth of the early sun because too much dew and too much wet on their wings actually does inhibit their ability to fly very well. So they do want to evaporate that off at some point. That is definitely a caterpillar. The question is, what's wrong with it? Yeah, that was one of the questions. It could have just gotten a virus, bacterial infection. Looks like it ate some of that. Yeah. And then died. But it's not a milkweed. Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a monarch. It's a monarch. Yeah. Yep. Wait, is it a monarch? It is a monarch. It's a monarch, yep. Is but for some reason, it is almost possible to know, but for some reason it died. So it's not alive right now? Correct. But it is a monarch. Yep. So they are here. Yeah. What I have found is that they, if you find one caterpillar on one plant, there's a tendency because the, the 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 female usually places eggs close by on other ones. So look, you know, close by where you found that one. And it's got a chrysalis over there. Oh, nice. Nice. And we'll decide if we want to. What is it? 
that your team? A chrysalis. Oh. Ah, okay. Well, you cannot leaf up too much. I see. Because when it's... You can see that little silk pad that they spun mm. and the hook they used to attach and the gold studs <laughs> on that chrysalis. On one of the it shorter doesn't look plants, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kelly, if we wanted to do a patch, yeah. I've seen people actually string them. Is that because of the birds or like with with like a thin structure? And a net over them? Yeah. Um, is, is that why some people do that? The birds shouldn't eat them because they're toxic the okay. caterpillars. So, so there shouldn't be ne necessary to screen over them. Now, the people. when I when I would uh, have them at my house when I collect all the larvae, I would actually dig up the milkweed with dirt, put them into a container, and then bring the whole thing home so that the plant would live longer, and then put the caterpillars all on it until it like consumed that plant and then have to replace it and keep recycling But you it do it way. for enjoyment or to make sure the, you get most of them to thrive? That was, that was predominantly as, as something to do with my daughter, for one, okay. and two was to bring it to the schools. Okay. So we get a, a, I'd make a chrysalis tree, right? which is really cool. I mean, I, some type of little branch that had little branches hanging out, and I tie the chrysalises all oh, over okay. it. So it literally was a chrysalis tree, like a Christmas tree, but with chrysalises. And all then over they it. would hatch into a cage, or no, just no. right out there in the classroom. Because when they hatch, they'll hang right from the shell of the chrysalis. The okay. old, the empty chrysalis will just hang there. So you and don't dry. even have to cage it because they're not going anywhere. For, when they for a hatch. short period of time. A but then, one, not even, not even, just that same day. Once they emerge and they're dry, ah. later that day. They'll be flying at your window trying to get out. Okay. So then you can either open the window or take a net and scoop them and then let them outside. Okay, because so. I wanted, like I said, I wanted to do this right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Wow. If anybody's looking for a place to collect caterpillars for the, like you were talking about, um, I always spend a lot of time in the fields that uh, go up Ames Hill Road. Ah. Uh, what is it? Ames Hill. Okay, I have to look at it. I'm new yeah. to here, so. Yep. Ames Hill Road, uh, just hit, hit some of the fields and just look for the milkweed in some of the fields. Those are some of my favorite spots to look for the, on the property? Rob Farm area. and Private property? Or? It is. Okay. It is. Their, their farm field is mm -hmm. private property, but you could stop and, and ask. Yeah. But right, yeah. okay. They're going to they're gonna cut down the milkweed at some point, so they'll probably be like, why do you want to go? I want to collect caterpillars. They'll probably look at you a little cross-eyed, but it's going to go <laughs> <laughs> looks like it. Definitely looks like it. Look alike. Viceroy. Okay. And the caterpillar is um, completely different. Oh. And the viceroy is smaller. Uh huh. Significantly smaller, but they look very similar. So they're and, the, and totally different from food the plants. And that's exactly why uh -huh. they would be consumed, but they've mimicked. Yeah. What's interesting is I have a lot of, I find that fascinating, the mimicry in nature. Um, there's a couple stink bugs. Huh. There is a katydid that hmm. mimics the pepsis wasp from the tropics. Wow. So they have very similar colorations, even though they're completely non-poisonous. But huh. visually, they look almost exactly like a pepsis wasp, so they've developed that. Wow to protect themselves. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. You'll find viceroys. What's interesting, viceroy is one of the few caterpillars that will uh, overwinter oh. in the caterpillar stage. They roll up, they feed on a young um, aspen, and they'll, they'll start at the very, very tip of the leaf, and they kind of skeletonize that leaf, mm. and they'll, make, they'll actually wrap the leaf into a little tube, and they'll live inside that tube and they put silk on to the stem of the actual baby tree so that the leaf doesn't fall off in the fall. So you'll find these little stems with that little tube and you, I would collect them and you can in the spring get fresh leaves and they'll come out and finish their life cycle. So it's, it's pretty neat. And they look like a bird dropping too. When they're adult, they, huh. they're, they're camouflage. Oh, that is a monarch. That is a monarch. That's yeah. the one that, look at how fast it's going. Yeah. And so, 
Is it true? Yeah. I heard this, but I don't know if it's true or not. Will the same adult individual make it all the way from Vermont to Mexico? Or is it going to do the, the, the laps like they do coming up? I have heard, and I'm, I'm not an expert on monarchs, so I want to make sure I'm clear on that, but I've heard, like yourself, that I still believe some of them do hopscotch, but if it's that late in the season, the, the, either the milkweed's gone and they go all the way down. I'm not saying necessarily from here, but from areas within the U.S., the populations will go all the way down. And I know there's, I know there's maps that you can look at online that show kind of these um, migration corridors, if you will, where they kind of go through. Because Mexico's not the only place they um, they overwinter. There's some other places that they overwinter. But the ones that are on the east coast of the United States probably yeah. go to Mexico. Yeah. But uh, that's, so I heard that they call them the super migrators. Oh, yes, incredible. So that, that last brood is, which is yeah. really amazing. And then they, and then they come back, and, the, and the, I've never been, even though I've been to Mexico, I've never been to the, the butterfly forest, or the monarch forest, but yeah. I guess it literally looks, instead of leaves, it's just, it's just hanging with yes, they're, thousands they're of them. Yes. <clears throat> We took a trip with Beak there about 10 years ago. Wow. And, uh, I guess that's a lot bigger than Monterey. And, uh, yes, it's very different. Else, very yeah. different, yeah. It's very high altitude, and um, you have to take horse to, horses to get in there. Um, they're trying to protect them more because they're just logging going from the trees. On. They're in every puddle. Every puddle is covered with them. <laughs> By the by the literally by the by the billions or yeah. wow. multiple millions wow. is but what's what's scary though is I remember them the last time I read about the migration, I don't remember where, but it could be National Geographic about how the the square miles or hectares down there that used to be covered has drastically shrunk. Um, and it's concerning. Part of the problem is illegal logging and yeah. We stayed in one little village and there were armed guards there because the, the game wardens, the forest wardens were staying there and so they had somebody on watch around the flock because they were not, because there were thieves coming in to steal the trees. It's pretty bad. And it goes back, I mean I could talk all day about habitat destruction, all of that. One thing I do touch on, and I feel like I have to, is there's been that push all the time, you know, we see it, you know, oh, we got to protect the elephant, we got to protect the tiger, we got to protect, whatever you want to pick. And the truth of the matter is, if, if any animal doesn't have a place to live, what's the point of protecting the animal? So more attention needs to be put on protecting large swaths of untouched forest, then the animals will be able to kind of take care of themselves. You know, they might still need protection from poaching, but at least they have a home where they can reproduce and um, continue to, to live in safety. But the cutting of our forests is, is what is doing more damage than any, any poaching. I mean, if you had vast forests, there's places for things to hide and reproduce. But you make those houses, those areas smaller and smaller and smaller, A, it's, it, it's easier to have them poached, and then they don't have a place to, to live, especially habitats that are very specific and that certain animals need very specific habitats and once that's gone that's it so but there's a lot of attention in the tropics now buying large areas of old growth forest to just leave it that way um so yeah no so yeah so uh, in closing thank you all for coming i hope you enjoyed yourselves and, and you. learned a few things I learned a few things and got some really good ideas. So you may be hearing from me in the next couple of years with some ideas of doing some like big trips to the tropics. <laughs> so, <laughs> organized, organized. Wow. So um, it's something to look look forward to and look into. Um, in closing, two things, I guess. If you have any questions, any interest, or if whatever you do outside of this today, your, your professional job or, or your other hobbies, if you want to have me come in and talk about stuff, especially with the kids, things like that, please ask. Um, and from a more professional standpoint, if you have stuff as fall is approaching, um, suspicious activity or illegal activity you're seeing, then I throw that out there too to give me a call. So look into that from a professional standpoint. So, <laughs> And if anyone would like to stay and continue searching and just admiring the rainbow, the rainbow and yeah, the rainbow. waiting for fireflies to come yeah, out, you're very welcome to stay. 
And if you need to mosey, feel free. And thank you all for coming. And thank Indeed. you so much, Kelly Price. You're very welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, yeah, thank you. And Ed and Mary Allen for setting everything up. Thank you.